reader tonight as we read the Torah. We're all open for a discussion. We're all the teachers. We're all learning together. So hallelujah. You will be my teachers as I read this Torah. I pray everyone has had an awesome Sabbath. We thank you. We thanks, give thanks to Yahweh for the uh, food that we've had and for the Sabbath we've had so far and ask his blessing on this Torah. Dear Heavenly Father Yahweh, we do thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for the food that we've eaten. We thank you for all your provisions. We thank you for giving us a Sabbath day to study your Torah. Now, as we open your Torah, please send your spirit among us and teach us your ways and let us learn what it is you would have us learn. In Yahshua's name, we ask. Make it so. Hallelujah. All right, again, my name is Eric Allen. This is Torah School from the Shalom Assembly of Yahweh. Coming here live from Dayton, Ohio, via Illinois, and also worldwide. Now, thank you. Again, we thank Yahweh for this Torah, and we thank, for, thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, please, in the chat room, please go ahead and enter your comments and your questions. Uh, shalom, Kadosh. I don't know if you're Isaiah or if you're Hector, but either way, shalom, both of you. <laughs> Hallelujah. And again, thank you for joining us. And uh, tonight we will be reading from Numbers 19, starting in verse 1. And then we're going to read all the way through chapter 22, but just verse 1. So we'll stop after verse 1 in chapter 22. It's 19, 1 through 22, 1. It is Huklat, which means decree or ordinance. It also comes from the uh, first word in the second in the second verse, which uh, the first key word in the passage, which is Yahweh has commanded, speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer. Okay, so without further ado, we will start reading at verse one, chapter nineteen, verse one. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, saying, "This is the law of the Torah, which Yahweh has commanded." saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer, a perfect one, in which there is no blemish, and on which no yoke has ever come, and you shall give it to Eleazar the priest, and he shall bring it outside the camp, and shall slaughter it before him. And you shall, and Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger, and sprinkle some of its blood seven times towards the front of the tent of meeting, and the heifer shall be burned before his eyes. He burns its hide, and its flesh, and its blood, and its dung, and the priest shall take cedar wood, and hyssop, and scarlet, and throw them into the midst of the fire that is burning the heifer, the priest shall then wash his garments and shall bathe his body in water and afterward come into the camp. But the priest is unclean until evening. And he who is burning it washes his garments in water and shall bathe his body in water and is unclean until evening. And a clean man shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and shall place them outside the camp in a clean place. And they shall be kept for the congregation of Israel for the water for uncleanness, for it is a cleansing from sin. Verse 10, And he who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his garments and is unclean until evening, and shall be, and it shall be a law forever to the children of Israel and to the stranger who sojourns in the midst. He who touches the dead of any human being is unclean for seven days. He is to cleanse himself with the water on the third day. And on the seventh day he is to be clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day, then on the seventh day he is not clean. 
Anyone who touches the dead of a human being and does not cleanse himself defiles the dwelling place of Yahweh, and that being shall be cut off from Israel. He is unclean, for the water for uncleanliness was not sprinkled on him. His uncleanness is still upon him. This is the Torah when a man dies in a tent. All who come into the tent and all who are in the tent are unclean for seven days. And every open vessel which has no cover fastened on it is unclean. And anyone in the open field who touches someone slain by a sword or who has died or a bone of a man or a grave is unclean for seven days. And for the unclean being they shall take some of the ashes of the heifer burnt for the cleansing from sin and running water shall be put on them in a vessel. And a clean man shall take his up and dip in the water and shall sprinkle it on the tent and on the vessels and all and on all the beings who were there or on the one who touched a bone or on the slain or on the dead or grave. And the clean one shall sprinkle the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day and on the seventh day he shall cleanse himself and shall wash his garments and shall bathe in water and shall be clean in the evening but the man who is unclean and does not cleanse himself that being shall be cut off from among the assembly because he has defiled the set apart place of Yahweh water for uncleanness has not been sprinkled on him he is unclean and it shall be a law forever for them forever and the one who sprinkles the water for uncleanness washes his garments and the one who touches the water for uncleanness is unclean until evening and whatever the unclean being touches is unclean and the being who touches it is unclean until evening All right so it was later on when we uh, on Facebook, a comment was made about how the, uh, and we will get there, but this apply, the comment applies also here for this situation. When we, uh, get to the, uh, serpent in the, in the, the fire serpents in the, in the wilderness that were biting all these children who were grumbling and moaning and complaining, and then they were being attacked by fiery serpents by Yahweh when they, when Moshe prayed for their deliverance, he was told to put a serpent on a stake, we'll get there, and, a, and on a pole, and a bronze serpent, and anyone who looked at upon that serpent was, was, was healed. The comment was made, that which kills, when you look upon that, we can, can cure. Also, this is the only time, as commentary has said, th this is the only t time that a sacrifice causes the priest to make the sacrifice to become unclean. But, that, but the priest becoming unclean, the sacrifice causes people who were defiled by death to become clean. So that's an interesting note that the comment may, applies here also, that that which is unclean can cause people to become clean, and of course that which kills can cause people to be saved. But yeah, and all right, verse, chapter 20, if any other comments. All right, chapter 20, verse 1, And the children of Israel... All the congregation came into the wilderness of Zen in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there, and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled against Moshe and against Aharon. And the people contended with Moshe and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brothers died before Yahweh. Why have you brought up the assembly of Yahweh into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? And why have you brought us up out of Mitzrayim 
to bring us to this evil place, not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moshe and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the esteem of Yahweh appeared to them. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Take the rod, and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and you shall speak to the rock before their eyes, and it shall give water, and you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give the drink to the congregation and their livestock. And Moshe took the rod from before Yahweh, as he commanded him. And Moshe and Aaron assembled the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock. Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock. That's interesting. That Moshe and Aaron, Moshe is now saying, shall we bring water for you, not watch and see what Yahweh will deliver you. Yes, he's angry. Yes, he's frustrated. But as the scriptures say in Matthew twelve thirty six. Yahshua speaking there, saying that we will be accountable for every idle word. Moshe will be accountable for his idle words. He spoke these in wrath. He probably did not mean to bring esteem to himself and take esteem from Yahweh, take glory from Yahweh, take away from Yahweh's power and say, yes, it's we that's bringing water for you out of this rock. But it was said. And that having been said, he will be accountable for his words. But there's more to the story also. As we read on, Then Moshe lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and much water came out, and the, con and the congregation and their livestock drank. He was told to speak to the rock, and now here he is striking the rock. Now this is speculation on my part. On this this reader's part right now is just pure speculation. No one knows what was going on in the mind of Moshe because it's not recorded. But imagining, if you will, that Moshe is thinking that speaking to the rock is not going to work. That's where I am with this. I'm seeing Moshe saying, well, that's not going to work. Don't you remember last time when this all started? Immediately after we crossed the, the Red Sea, when I struck the rock, I had to strike the rock. So that's why Moshe struck the rock with his, with his staff, because he did not think that speaking, in my opinion, he did not think that speaking to the rock would, would be an effective measure, measure. He wanted a demonstration. He wanted, he, wanted, he wanted the children, at least, the children of Israel, to see some kind of demonstration. And he did not believe that they would believe that Yahweh had done it if he just spoke to the rock. Or he would not believe that speaking to the rock would work. Just as uh, with uh, the story of El Elishua, when the Syrian commander was told that there is a healer, a prophet in Israel that could cure him of his of his leprosy. He goes down there and he's expecting some kind of mumbo jumbo, some kind of potion, some kind of magic word, some kind of dance, something that his pagan priests always do. What does Elisha Eli say? Go wash and dip in, this, in the Yardane seven times. And he's thinking, there are cleaner rivers in, in Syria. I've got cleaner rivers back home. I can wash in a cleaner river. I expected you to do this or that. You're not a prophet. And he walks away. Of course, his servants that are with him humble him, and he does humble himself and dip in the river, and it works. But Moshe, in my opinion, is not thinking that speaking to the rock would work for whatever reason. But, continuing on now, verse 12, 
But Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, Because you did not believe, because you did not believe me to set me apart in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you do not bring this assembly into the land which I gave them. These were the waters of Merah because the children of Israel contended with Yahweh, and he was set apart among them. Now, another teaching goes that the rock followed them around throughout the wilderness, and Mer as long as Miriam was alive, Miriam was able to bring water from the rock, probably by speaking to the rock. Of course, it's Yahweh that brings water from the rock, and when Miriam died, the water stopped. But now Moshe was told to speak to the rock, and he struck the rock, and the water came back. And now Moshe is not going into uh, the land because he said, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. So he brought glory to himself, whether inadvertently in anger or directly. And Yahweh says he did not believe, so I'm speculating he did not believe he would not, that speaking to the rock would not be effective. But now this rock that followed them around, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, that the rock is Messiah. So that would stand to reason how the rock is following them around and giving them the life-giving water as in John chapter 3 where he says the life-giving water or in John chapter 12 or John chapter 4 yeah we'll read that in John chapter 4 we'll read that later alright in John chapter 4 he says it's the uh, life-giving water alright but continuing on now in verse 14, and Moshe sent messengers from Kadesh to the sovereign of Edom, Edom. This is what your brother Israel said. You know all the hardship that has befallen us, and that our fathers went down to Mitzrayim and dwelt in Mitzrayim a long time, and the Mitzrites did evil to us and our fathers, and we cried out to Yahweh, and he heard our voice. And the messenger brought us up from Mitzrayim, and see, we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your land. We shall not pass over through the fields or vineyards, nor drink water from the wells. We shall go along the sovereign's highway. We shall not turn aside right or left until we have passed over your border. Edom said to him, You do not pass over through me, lest I come out against you with the sword. And the children of Israel said to him, We shall go by the highway, and if I or my livestock drink any of your water, then I shall pay for it. Only let me pass over on foot without a word. But he said, You do not pass over. And Edom came out against them with many men and a strong hand. So when Edom refused to let Israel pass over through his border, Israel turned away from him. And the children of Israel, all the company, departed from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Haran in Mount Hor, near the border of the land of Edom, saying, A heron is to be gathered to his people, for he is not to enter the land which I gave, which I have given to the children of Israel, because you rebelled against my mouth at the water of Meribah. Take a heron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up to Mount Hor, and strip a heron of his garments, and put them on Eleazar his son, for Aharon is to be gathered to his people, and die there. And Moshe did as Yahweh commanded, and they went up to Mount Hor before the eyes of all the congregation. And Moshe stripped Aharon of his garments, and put them on Eleazar his son, and Aharon died there on the top of the mountain, and Moshe and Eleazar came down from the mountain. And when all the congregation saw that Aharon was dead, dead, 
all the house of Israel wept for Aaron thirty days. Alright, comments, questions on chapter 20? Any, any questions on chapter 20? Alright, so they go to Edom, and Edom says, you're not passing over, so they turn back, and now they're going to walk all the way around Edom. A long way around, before they get back to the Sovereign's Highway and try to pass over after they go past the border of Edom. Alright, chapter 21. And the Sovereign of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the way to Atharim, and he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. Then Israel made a vow to Yahweh and said, If you deliver this people into my hand, then I shall put their cities under the ban. And Yahweh listened to the voice of Israel and gave them up and gave up the Canaanites, and they put them and their cities under the ban. So the name of the place was called Hormah. Now that's, when they say under the ban, what they are talking about is dedicated for a specific purpose. In this place, it seems to be the purpose of destruction, totally useless, to, to definitely not being used by man, and never will be used by man, except for the pur purpose of serving Yahweh. That is dedicated to Yahweh, or, or, or in this case, dedicated to destruction, is going to be completely destroyed and not used. And that's what they're meaning by under the ban here. So verse 4. And they departed from Mount Hor by way of the Sea of Reeds to go around the land of Edom. But the being of the people grew impatient because of the way. And the people spoke against Elohim and against Moshe. Why have you brought us up out of Mitzrayim to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our being loathes this light bread. And Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Then the people came to Moshe and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahweh and against you. Pray to Yahweh to take away the serpents from us from to take away the serpents serpents from us. So Moshe prayed on behalf of the people, and Yahweh said to Moshe, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moshe made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and it came to be if a serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent he lived so okay verse 8 and Moshe so Moshe made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and it came to be if a serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent he lived and the children of Israel set out and camped in Oboth. And they departed from Oboth and camped at Eri Hayarim in the wilderness which is east of Moab toward sunrise. From there they set out and camped at the Wadi Zered. And from there from there they set out and camped at Hallelujah. And from there they set out and camped. All right, where are we at? And, and they departed from Urbath and came and came to Eri Ha Abarim in the wilderness, which is east of Moab, toward the sunrise. From there they set out and camped at the Wadi Zered. And from there they set out and camped on the other side of the Arnon, which is in the wilderness that extends from the border of the Amorites, for the Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Therefore, it is said in the book of the battles of Yahweh, Walheb and Sufa, 
the wadi of Ranan. And the slope of the wadi that turns aside to the dwelling place of Ur and lies at the border of Moab. And from there unto Bear, Bear, which is where the well, where Yahweh said to Moshe, Gather the people and let me give them water. Of course, Bear being the Hebrew word for water, for well. So Bear is where Yahweh said, Gather the people and let me give them water. And that is the well, which Yahweh said about that. And then verse 17, Israel then sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing to it. A, a well, the leaders sank, which the nobles of the people dug with their staves by the word of the lawgiver. Then the wilderness, then from the wilderness unto Matah, and from Matah unto Mahath, Nahaliel, and from Nahaliel to Bamoth. And from Bamoth in the valley that is in the country of Moab to the top of Pisgah, which looks down on the wasteland. And Israel sent messengers to Sihon, sovereign of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We shall not turn off from the fields or vineyards. We shall not drink water from the wells, but go by the way of the sovereign's highway until we have passed over your border. But Sihon would not allow Israel to pass through his border. So Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel in the wilderness. And he came to Yahatz and fought against Israel. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon to the, to the Yabak as far as the children of Ammon. For the border of the children of Ammon was strong. And Israel took all these cities and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon and in its villages. For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, the sovereign of the Amorites, who had fought against the former sovereigns of Moab and taken all his land from his hand as far as the Arnon. That is why those who speak in Proverbs say, Come to Heshbon. That the city of Sihon be built and established. For fire went out from Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sihon, and it consumed Ar of Moab, the masters of the heights of the Arnon. Woe to you, Moab! You have perished, O people of Kemesh. He has given his sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity. To Sihon, sovereign of the Amorites. Then we shot them. Heshbon has perished as far as Debon, and we laid waste as far as Nophah, which reaches Meyaba, Meyadeba. So Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. And Moshe went to spy out Yazer, and they took its villages and drove out the Amorites who were there, and turned and went by the way of the Bashan, and Og, sovereign of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people, to battle at Edre. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand, with all the people of his, hand, of his land, and you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, sovereign of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon. And they smote him, and his sons, and all his people, until no remnant was left to him, and they took possession of his land. And the children of Israel set out and camped in the desert plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan of Jericho. And one would wonder, because there's many stories in the Talmud about how Og was one of the uh, was one of the Nethinim, uh, one of the giants. How he fought side by side with Abraham on Abraham's side when Abraham went to rescue Lot. 
There are many stories. I wonder if Moshe knew these stories. That's why Yahweh said, do not fear him. But, and the story is also said that Moshe himself slew Og. Mm. Excuse me. <coughs> All right. Here's Numbers chapter 22, verse 1. That ends that Torah portion. Now we go on to the half Torah, which is 11. Judges chapter 11, verses 1 through 33. And we again see that the cities of Ammon were given to Moshe and that no wrong was done to the Amorites at that time. But the Amorites are going to claim that it was. And Yiphtah, the Gileadite, Giladite was a mighty, brave one, but he was the son of a whore, and Gilead brought forth Yiphtah. And the wife of Gilead bore sons, and when his wife grew, and his when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Yiphtah out, and said to him, "You shall not have an inheritance in the house of our father, for you are the son of another woman." And Yiphtah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men banded together with Yiphtah, and went out with him. And it came to be some time later that the children of Ammon fought against Israel. And it came to be when the children of Ammon fought against Israel that the elders of Gilad went to bring Yiphtah out of the land of Tob. And they said to Yiphtah, Come, and you shall be our commander, and let us fight against the children of Ammon. But Yiphtah said to the elders of Gilad, Did you not hate me, and drive me from my father's house? Why have you come now and when you are in trouble. And the elders of Gilad said to Yiphtah, That is the reason we have turned to you, that you shall go with us and fight against the children of Ammon, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilad. And Yiphtah said to the elders of Gilad, If you take me back home to fight against the children of Ammon, and Yahweh gives them to me, am I to be your head? And the elders of Gilad said to Yiphtah, Yahweh is witness between us if we do not do according to your words. Then Yiphtah went out with the elders of Gilad, and the people set over them, set him over them as head and commander, and Yiphtah smoke, spoke all his words before Yahweh in Mizpah. And Yiphtah sent messengers to the sovereign of the children of Ammon, saying, What is between you and me that you have come to fight against me in my land. And the sovereign of the children of Ammon said to the messengers of Yiphtah, Because Yisrael took my land when they came up out of Mitzrayim from the Arnon as far as Yabok, and to the Yarden. And now give back these lands in peace. But Yiphtah again sent messengers to the sovereign of the children of Ammon, and said to him, this is what Yiphtah said. Israel did not take the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. For when they came up from Mitzrayim, and Israel walked through the wilderness as far as the Sea of Reeds, and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers to the sovereign of Edom, saying, Please let me pass over through your land. But the sovereign of Edom would not listen. And they also went to the sovereign of Moab, but he refused. So Israel stayed at Kadesh. Then they went through the wilderness around the land of Edom and the land and the land of Moab, and came to the east side of the land of Moab, and encamped beyond the Arnon. But they did not enter the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers to Sichon, sovereign of the Amorites, sovereign of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, Please let me pass over through your land to our place. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass over through his border, and Sihon gathered all his people together, and they encamped in Yahatz and fought against Israel. And Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them, so Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites, 
the inhabitants of that land. Thus they took possession of all the border of the Amorites from Anan to Yabak and from the wilderness to the Yardin. And now Yahweh Elohim of Israel has driven out the Amorites from before his people Israel. Should you then possess it? Whatever Kamesh your mighty one gives you to possess, do you not possess it? And all that Yahweh our Elohim takes possession of before us, we possess. And now, are you any better than Balak, son of Zippor, sovereign of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? Well, Israel dwelt in Hezbon and its villages, and Ariar and its villages, and in all the cities along the banks of the Arnon for 300 years. Why did you not recover them within that time? So I have not sinned against you, but you are doing me evil by fighting against me. Let Yahweh judge. Let Yahweh the judge judge today between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. But the sovereign of the children of Ammon did not listen to the words which Yithah sent him. And the spirit of Yahweh came upon Yithah, and he passed through Gilad and Manasseh, and passed through Mitzvah of Gilad, and from Mitzvah of Gilad he passed on towards the children of Ammon. And Yithah made a vow to Yahweh and said, If you give the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall belong to Yahweh, and I shall offer it up as a burnt offering. Now this is again speculation on the behalf of this reader, but it seems that he would, maybe every time he went out to the market, every time he went out someplace else doing whatever he was doing, when he came back, that a lamb, this one little lamb, would always come out and greet him. So he's thinking this one little lamb will come out and greet him this time. This is just speculation. But he says, whatever comes out to meet me, whatever comes out to meet me when I come back, I will offer up to Yahweh. As a burnt offering, Yahshua said, do not take a vow. Do not take an oath, yet you yea be yea, and you no be no. It is better if you do not take an oath, but if you take an oath, fulfill it. For if you take an oath and do not fulfill it, that is not a good thing. But anyway, he takes an oath. He takes a vow. He says, whatever comes out to meet me, I will go for up. And I'm sure he's thinking of a lamb. That's just my speculation. But then Yiphtah passed on toward the children of Ammon to fight against them. And Yahweh gave them into his hands. And he smote them from Ariar as far as Meneth. Twenty cities, and to Abel Karim, a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were humbled before the children of Israel. The story does not continue. We had the gist of what Yahweh gave the children of Ammon these cities into the hands of Israel, and then Ammon tries to take them back, and the, the leader that Yahweh set over them says, No, this land was given to Moshe, and you, we did you no wrong. You, did, you attempted to do wrong to us, and you failed, because Yahweh is mightier than your Kamesh ever thought of being. So, he gave us the land. It's been 300 years. You've done nothing about it until now. And then, well, as the story goes, he gets bitten again, and he gets destroyed again, and yeah. All right, but now, if we were to read on, we would see that it was actually the daughter that came out, and the daughter was was <laughs> given to Yahweh, because he kept his vow. But he was not expecting a daughter. I'm, I'm sure he was not expecting a human to come out. All right, John chapter 3, uh, Yahshua says, mentions the, uh, the, the bronze serpent on a stake, and then... We read here in John chapter 4, verses 3, 
all the way through 30, we'll see that Yahshua is the living water, as Paul says he was in 1 Corinthians. So, now we're going to start back in verse 1. I don't know why it said to start in verse 3. So, when the Master knew that the Pharisees had heard that Yahshua had made and immersed more taught ones than Yohanan, although Yahshua himself did not immerse, but his taught ones, he, Yahshua, left Yehuda and went again to Galil. And he went, and he had to pass through Shamron. So he came to a city of Shamron called Shechem, near the piece of land Yaakov gave to his son Yosef. And Yaakov's fountain was there, so Yahshua, being wearied from the journey, was sitting thus at the fountain, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Shamarin came to draw water, and Yahshua said to her, Give me to drink, for his taught ones had gone off into the city to buy food. The woman of Shamarin therefore said to him, how is it that you, being a Yehudite, ask me a drink? Ask a drink from me, a woman of Shamron, for Yehudim do not associate with Shamronites or Samaritans, as some versions say, Samaritans. So a Jew does not talk to a Samaritan. And Yahshua answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of Elohim, and who it is who says to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Master, you have no vessel, and the well is deep. From where then do you have living water? Are you greater than our father Yaakov, who gave this who gave us the well, and drank from it himself and his sons? and his cattle. Yeshua answered and said to her, Everyone drinking of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I give him shall certainly never thirst, and the water that I give him shall become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Master, give me this water so that I do not thirst nor come here to draw. Yahshua said to her, Go, call your husband, and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Yahshua said to her, You have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Master, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you, you people, that's not politically correct, you people, say that in Jerusalem is the place where one needs to worship. Yahshua said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem, worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because the deliverance is of the Yehudim. But the error is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father also does seek such to worship Him. Elohim is spirit, and those who worship Him need to worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one who is called anointed. When that one comes, he shall announce to us all. Yahshua said to her, I who am speaking to you am he. And upon this his taught one and upon this his taught ones came and they were marveling that he was speaking with a woman. However, no one had said, What do you seek? Or, Why do you speak to her? The woman then left her water jug and went away to the city and said to the men, Come, see, a man 
who told me all that I have done. Is this not the Messiah? They they went out of the city and were coming to him. All right. So Yahshua is the living water, and Yahshua was the uh, rock that followed them through the wilderness, which they got water from. And again, we be careful. We will be held accountable for every idle word, as the vow which Yifta had taken and said, "I will give you whatever comes out to meet me." And he, of course, held himself accountable for his idle words. And when Moshe spoke, most likely just because he's frustrated with the children of always grumbling, always complaining, and not intentionally trying to dishonor Yahweh, but he said, shall we bring water for you from this rock? So we need to be very careful and give honor to Yahweh in all our words, and all our deeds, and all our thoughts, and watch our idle words, and be careful what we speak. So that is the Torah portion for today. And we thank you very much for joining us. Any other questions or comments, go ahead and type them in. And we will address that. But right now, thank you, Father Yahweh, for this your Sabbath again. We thank you for your Sabbath. We thank you for your Torah. We thank you for sending your spirit among us and teaching us your Torah. We thank you for giving us your Torah and your instructions. We ask now that we can live by your Torah and your instructions, that we can follow your instructions and live as you have wanted us to live and live the life you want us to have. Now, as we go about our work week, as we go about our business, the six days that we shall labor, shall we stay kingdom focused? May your kingdom be always on the forefronts of our minds. May your will always be on the forefronts of our minds. And may we bring people closer to you. Show them your love. And may our actions, our words, and our deeds always bring honor to you and bring people closer to you and bring people subject to your kingdom. And may your kingdom come quickly. And may we act to bring your kingdom. In Yahshua's name we ask. Please make it so. Hallelujah. Alright, again, that's all I have for you today. If we have any other questions. Yes.